Erb. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melinda. We are now recording, and I want to call the uh, Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021, uh, Dr. Cog board work session to order. It is uh, one minute after four on November 3rd. Call to order is done. Public comment is next. I know, Melinda, you're busy transferring people, but we have time set aside for public comment at all of our meetings. Uh, let me ask if there is anybody who, from uh, attending from the public who would like to uh, address the board. I don't see anybody on the phone, so I imagine everybody has the raise hand function in uh, uh, Zoom. Uh, seeing none. Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, item three, summary of the September 1st board work session. Um, I hope that folks have had a chance to look it over. I did. I was not at that meeting. I was starting a week of travel then, so I just wanted to um, thank Chair uh, Stolzman for uh, filling in for me that day. So if there's uh, no objection, we will accept that summary and move forward to item four, uh, which is one of our two main uh, items of business here. Um, discussion of the Multimodal Options Fund integration options with uh, senior planner Todd Cottrell. Is Todd ready to present? Yes, he is. I see it on the screen. I am. Todd, Thank you so much. Sure. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, board members. Um, so we have a lot of information here to unpack in eight slides. Um, so I'm hoping up front that I'm not going to lose anyone. Um, but what we're trying to get through is uh, a con the continuation of the Multimodal Options Fund funding source and how to integrate that through a couple options that staff are presenting from FY22, so our current year, through FY27. So through Senate Bill 18, uh, Dr. Cog um, was able to allocate uh, a funding source, source from the state called Multimodal Options Fund. The purpose of this through the course of the last tip cycle was to further develop a complete and integrated multimodal transportation system. Uh, eligibility included active transportation, so bike and ped, uh, transit, both operational and capital, multimodal mobility, and of course, studies. Um, so of, this, of the statewide total, uh, Dr. Cog received approximately $46 million. Uh, this funding source did contain and require a 50% match, and there was an end date on this funding source, meaning that all, fun, all funds expired in June of 23. So currently project sponsors who have this funding source on their projects are working towards that date, hopefully to avoid that date and, and to get their projects completed before that. Um, so earlier this year, as part of Senate Bill 260, uh, this program was renewed and renamed the Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Options Fund. Uh, the eligibility was slightly expanded to include modeling and greenhouse gas mitigation projects that decrease VMT or increase multimodal travel. Um, one thing at this point, uh, Dr. Cog does not know what the distribution of the statewide total will be. Um, however, um, based on the, the formula that was used for the last tip cycle, we expect that to be approximately $167 million uh, from the current fiscal year through the end of federal fiscal year 27. Uh, the CDOT Transportation Commission is expected to take up action uh, this month for that distribution formula. So hopefully later within the next two or three weeks, we will know exactly what those numbers will be. Um, as part of this funding package, the state did a little, it did something different. Um, and they heavily front loaded the current fiscal year with federal ARPA funds, which are the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, these ARPA funds have a obligation deadline of the end of 2024 an expenditure deadline of the end of 2026. So very similar to the previous package of funds, um, the obligation deadline simply says that they must be at that point in a particular stage of their project to be able to move on by the end of 24 and must completely expend those funds by the end of 26. Um, so you can see the, the graphic that we put there on the bottom of your screen 
that sort of outlines the expectation of funds over the six year period. Now, as we were sort of going through and learning about this new funding source and thinking of ways, well, what is the best way to program it? Um, we did go through a number of potential issues and roadblocks and different methods that we could to program this. So we just wanted to share those with you. Um, the first being is that this funding program continues with a 50% match and the listing of eligible projects is somewhat limited in the flexibility of the program. Uh, that is concerning in the respect that in the previous cycle, um, it did also contain a 50% match and it had that limited flexibility and was fairly difficult to program, um, especially when we were combining it with other, other federal funding sources that had only a 20% match. So of course, if you're a project sponsor, you certainly don't necessarily want to put forth more match than necessary. Um, the next step is looking at the funding that's contained in the current fiscal year in addition to next year, 2023. Um, according to TIP policy, uh, Dr. Cog will program funds from our current wait list, our wait list from the 22 to 25 TIP first. However, when we go through that list, there are some limitations on the existing projects on that list that deal with, well, maybe multimodal funds won't necessarily take care of some of those projects, again, just based on the eligibility limitations. Uh, it's certainly possible, but we can certainly work with pro project sponsors to possibly, you know, conduct some funding swaps that would potentially remove some of those projects off the list. Uh, but there is not a great deal number of those that we could go through. Um, another item that we would certainly look at is, well, since we do have an influx, a large influx of funds, what if we just simply hold another call for projects for the current tip cycle? Well, if we continue down the path of our scheduled 24 to 27 tip cycle, uh, that will be at approximately the same time starting in January of our regional call for the 24 to 27 tip. So certainly I think from a staff perspective, uh, we would not wanna hold two calls for projects for two separate tip cycles at the same time. Um, it would certainly would just add to the confusion. Uh, the next item is, kind of deals with how we conduct TIP cycles. So uh, Dr. Cog creates a brand new TIP every two years. However, we only select projects every four years. So that meaning in the 22 to 25 TIP cycle, uh, fiscal years 24 and 25 are simply not programmed um, with Dr. Cog allocated uh, projects and funds. So do we take those newly discovered multimodal funds in 22 and 23? Just we simply just wait and program that until the new 24 to 27 tip. Part of the uh, conversations we've been having also deal with, we don't know what's gonna happen with the FAST Act and it's the uncertainty that deals with that. Um, we've heard that there certainly could be a vote on a new bill this week. Um, it's anyone's guess. There's a continuing resolution for the FAST Act that goes through December 3rd. So at least for now, we know how long the FAST Act will continue for. Um, the assumption is right now, based on a reading of the bill as it states right now, that we will receive additional 22 and 23 funds to program. We just don't know exactly if the bill that we're viewing right now will be the final bill that passes. So kind of taking all of this information to account, um, we sort of developed, well, there's two overarching goals for this process. Um, the first is because these ARPA funds are contained within FY22, um, we, we would really like to get those out the door as soon as possible. So really maximize the opportunity to meet those spending timeframes. The second really deals with the 50% match of the multimodal funds. Um, we certainly would like to be able to leverage the existing federal funds against the multimodal funds um, to create and lower that match lower than 50% for the multimodal funds. But regardless of um, the options that we'll present here in a second, there's two things that we certainly wanted to state up front is first, we will continue to work through the adopted TIP policy 
and conduct that wait list process first. Um, just earlier this week, I did send an email notification out to all those existing sponsors on, the, on those project wait lists and really notified them to start looking at their projects um, so that when funding does come through and we it's confirmed to come through on both multimodal options fund and if a new bill is passed relatively soon, that we can start working in selecting projects off that waiting list. The second is because there's a lot of influx and to assist in reducing that, that multimodal fund match from 50% down to 20%, um, we've looked at conducting any future calls using two tracks. Um, so you can look at this as two individual parallel tracks um, or using two applications within the calls for projects. The first would be, and again, our naming convention isn't necessarily the best, uh, but a STBG track. So we would use those STBG funds along with any eligible project that is, that is eligible for those STBG funds. Um, that would require and keep a 20% match requirement. The second track um, called the air quality and multimodal would use a combination of federal sources. So or state and federal sources. So one, the multimodal options fund, um, CMAC funding, uh, TA, which is transportation alternatives. And if a new bill passes, there is a proposed new program called the Carbon Reduction Program, which is um, proposed to be very similar to how CMAC is. Um, and we certainly would combine those funds and this call or this track and application would use um, for only those eligible projects. Um, we would continue to allocate for our 20% local match um, by combining these funds. So for example, if multimodal funds is used in one of these air quality and multimodal tracks, we would be able to combine a project using multimodal funds, a combination of uh, other federal sources, and then an also a match. So the first of the two options, option A is called sequential. Um, so there's a lot of information that's located in the slide. So I'll try just to highlight what I perceive as probably the most important information. So this simply says is that we will conduct four calls for projects. The first two will be a regional and a sub-regional call um, for the 22 to 25 period. And it would only utilize this air quality and multimodal track. Uh, we would be able to start this call in January of next year for the regional call. Uh, follow, that up, follow that up in May with the sub-regional call. And then by the time we get to approximately a year from now in October, we would be able to amend those projects that were uh, selected using those two call for projects directly into the 22 to 25 tip. Immediately following that, we would hold an additional two calls, regional and sub-regional. This would cover the 24 to 27 time period, but would utilize both tracks. So this STB, STBG track and the air quality track. Uh, we expect we'd be able to kick that off in October of next year uh, and conclude the sub-regional call in June of 23. Uh, we would then immediately go through the process to adopt a new 24 to 27 tip um, later in 2023. The second option is what we're calling the parallel track. Um, and I think most importantly, this really combines everything into one regional and sub-regional call that will cover everything from fiscal year 22 to 20, to, uh, down to 27. Um, those projects that are selected for funding in 22 to 25, we will be able to immediately amend the 22 to 25 tips or the current tip. Those remaining projects that are in those out years would be automatically placed into the new tip 24 to 27. And then of course, those projects that were selected and put into the 22 to 25 tip, but automatically just be incorporated into the 24, 27 tip when adopted. Uh, so again, it would cover the 22 to 27 period, including all the funding sources that we have. Um, we expect that we would be able to open that up in January of next year. Um, it would take slightly longer because, again, we're using both of those parallel tracks, conclude that in November of next year, um, and then work through the process to adopt the 24 to 27 tip um, 
right about on the schedule that we would normally have an adopt a tip in that April to May timeframe of 2023. So now that we kind of you know, have a basic understanding of what those two options are, um, we just wanted to highlight some of the pros and cons of, these, of both of these options. So option A, sequential, again, it's the four calls for projects um, back to back. Um, this would allow for the quickest allocation um, of those new, newly identified multimodal funds. And again, that's especially important when we're looking at those FY22 funds, which have those obligation and end dates attached to them. Um, as compared to the parallel process, that looks at uh, we'd be able to allocate those in October versus December of next year for that parallel track. In addition, since we're just using the air quality multimodal track first for that first um, 22 to 25 um, calls for projects, they would allow us to just sort of work out any additional details that need to work out um, instead of using those air quality multimodal and the SPG, SP, S, <laughs> SPG DBG track right away at the same time. Um, I think most importantly from the staff perspective, um, as part of the greenhouse gas rulemaking, there is a required RPD, um, RTP update that is required by October 1st of next year. That would allow that update to occur before we really look into programming the 24 to 27 tip call. Uh, when we look at the parallel track, we do recognize that this is the quickest overall. Again, it just has one regional and one sub-regional call. Um, you know, both, both these parallel funding tracks, um, we do expect that would take slightly longer. So that would delay the allocation of those 22 to 25 funds. Again, only by two or three months, but I think it's important to recognize um, it's important to get those FY22 funds out the door as quick as possible. Um, and finally, when we're looking at the RPD updates um, and the tip calls for projects, we certainly would not want them to sort of work on top of each other if we can help it. Um, there is that potential looking at any you know, policy misalignments that may take place as part of either one of those processes. So, so that's sort of the quick and dirty overview of a couple options that uh, staff has presented. Um, I think that's all the information that we have and certainly can and talk through these uh, as much as you'd like. Thank you, Todd. Um, uh, solicit uh, questions from members, but before we have one, oh, we have one. Uh, Director Dale, go ahead. Yes, Todd, have you have you briefed uh, our staff or technical experts on this at all yet? Uh, yes, last month we did have a discussion with the TAC um, regarding both of these options and Every TAC member that was in attendance at that meeting was in favor of option A, the sequential process. Not talking about TAC, I'm talking about staff in our, staff at our cities. So our, our my counterparts in the cities are gonna understand this better and, and be on top of it and be able to do better than I am. And I'm leaving council in January. So I wanna know if, like for my part, if Steve Glick has been briefed on this. So, so one, I would, I would go back to the TAC discussion we've had. I think that's a good representative sample. In addition to that, um, we have begun to have initial discussions with some of the forums. Um, we've just had a discussion with the Douglas County Forum uh, directly before this. So um, we have not reached out to anyone else or any other forums directly, um, but I think that we certainly could do that. It makes sense to me for continuity of, of uh, work and uh, I, I don't have, that's, that's what's on my mind, making sure somebody knows more about it than me in, in a two, month and a half. Thank you. Is that it, uh, Director? Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. I'll make note that I'm watching the live transcript here because I want to save it then when you, you called on Todd, the transcript called him God. So uh, I don't know if that means it's a, he's, 
this presentation <laughs> is infallible or not. But uh, that was pretty good there, I, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I do have questions about it. Uh, Director Teal, go ahead. Uh, Todd, a question that actually arose when you were uh, addressed, you know, uh, presenting to the Douglas County Forum earlier today is, um, can you give us an idea what kind of projects are going to be allowed um, if in the instance of a sequential and to push out the fiscal year 2022 MMOF, uh, the CMAC, the, the TA, Give us an idea what kind of projects fall into each one of those categories and uh, what kind of projects we'd be looking to take care of in that first part of the sequential plan. Yeah, I, I think it might be easier to approach it from a different direction to say which projects probably would not be eligible under the uh, air quality multimodal track. Uh, primarily, um, we're looking at roadway capacity projects. Um, it is, and again, we haven't had a full internal discussions to allow which projects would be contained within each call, but I would certainly think that it would exclude a lot of roadway operational projects. Um, roadway um, reconstruction projects would not be allowed and eligible under the air quality and multimodal. So then Ron, what I didn't know if that I'm sorry, go ahead. So then what does that leave us with that would be eligible? Right, um, certainly looking at active transportation projects, um, maybe, uh, maybe a TDM project, uh, transit projects would certainly be eligible. But I think those, those are the three big categories that certainly would be the focus um, within that track. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Director Brockett. Yeah, thanks for all that, uh, Todd. And let me just say, I've always respected you, but with your new uh, status, uh, I respect <laughs> you even more. Um, but, um, so thanks for all that information. Question for you, you said that uh, we would still follow the policy of funding uh, waitlist projects first, um, but then we've also got a new call for calls for project that you're describing. Can you just describe to us how that will work in terms of funding what's on the wait list and then moving to new projects? Yeah, it's gonna get very interesting because we would hope that we could start the waiting list process before late January when we would want to release the call for projects for the regional share. Um, but we certainly expect that they would overlap. So the, really the first step within the waiting list process is to have an identification of those from funds from CDOT. So again, the two sources would be the multimodal source, multimodal options fund, and any additional sources that would come in if a new bill passes. Um, at that time, we would hopefully know uh, what, how, what our level of funding is for 22 and 23 to program to the wait list. Uh, we would simply start by you know, walking down the list um, for each of the region and the subregions list, ask a sponsor if they're um, willing to accept funds for that project. If they are, uh, we would fund that. If not, we would simply keep moving down. And again, that would comprise, our, our total funds available would be comprised of the total unallocated amount within 22 and 23. Now it does get a little complicated because at the same time, we're gonna to have to know and have a target funding for the regional call that we would be releasing um, in that late January timeframe. So it is certainly possible as we move down the waiting list, our regional target for funds may end up decreasing slightly. Um, it, it's one of those things that we wish we could handle one and then handle the other. Um, but again, we're certainly just going to have to be aware of what that funding level is. Um, I don't think it's going to change the structure of how the regional call would be conducted. It's just a matter of being aware of what that funding target may be at a certain time, because certainly it could fluctuate. Thanks for that. And then um, follow up. Do we have a sense of the relative magnitude of the projects that are eligible that are on the wait list versus the available funding? Like, are we potentially going to exhaust our funding with the wait list or, or do we have a lot more money than we have projects waiting? 
Um, the amount of projects that we have on the wait list will exceed the amount of funds that we will probably have, but it's really going to come down to the eligibility. So it's going to come down to what is that level of multimodal funds and which projects would be eligible for that funding type, in addition to which projects we could fund using the new funding type. So um, it's not a simple answer because we do not know the level of funds exactly what it's going to be. Um, but we did take a brief look at the waiting list projects, and we certainly expect that we're not going to be able to exhaust the entire waiting list um, simply because rarely do we actually do that. Um, but at the same time, there are some eligibility limitations that we're going to have. Thanks, sir. That's all I have. Mr. Mr. Chair. Unmute. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, is that Ron? Excuse yes, it is. Me? Thank you. I saw your hand up. I, I was trying to text you to see if you needed to clarify. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to maybe take a little bit um, different tack on this because as Todd said, it, it is it is rather complicated. The, the, the amount of funding available to go through the waitlist process does not represent the total amount of money we expect over this next tip cycle. It's only funding that we may have available that we did not expect during the 20 through 23 tip. So remember, we have projects programmed in those four years, 20, to 20 through 23. We, our current tip policy says if we, if we have new unexpected revenue available bef before the last year of that tip cycle, so before October 1 of 2022 would be the trigger, then we, that triggers the waitlist process with whatever those available resources are for, the, for that time period, within that tip period. So I, I think it's, it, maybe it's a little bit of a misstatement to say that the, the, we wouldn't, that, we, that the money we have would be exhausted by the waitlist projects. That's, that's, that's not true. It's we, what we don't know is exactly how much money we might have available to go through the waitlist process before October 1st of 2022 under the current TIP policy. And that, that's the piece. And, and Todd correctly says, you know, what we're, what we're proposing is that, you know, most of that money that would be available would really be the multimodal options fund money and, and CMAC money and, and some SDBG money for projects that are already in the waitlist of that 20 through 24 TIP. Um, and, and the bulk of the money will still be available to go through this, this TIP process, but the timing is not ideal. Um, trying to go through that waitlist process in the very near term now, perhaps overlapping into the, into the first part of next year while we're beginning the regional share call um, under, that, under that option A process. Thank you. The option, uh, sorry, the, the alternative yeah. for, the for the board to consider would be, and you've done this before, a policy, a policy exception to basically wrap all of that money into this next tip process and forego the waitlist process. I think that's that's an that's an alternative that's available um, as well. All right, thank you, uh, Executive Director Rex. Did you want to jump in here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I, I wanted to uh, just go back a little bit on uh, Director Dale's comments with regards to reaching out to local staff, and because I, I think that's a an important consideration for sure, and we will definitely do that. I just want to shed a little bit more light on the Transportation Advisory Committee and its role, um, just so everybody's aware. And I know we got a number of new board members who have not gone through this process before, but the Transportation Advisory Committee or the TAC um, is, a, is a representative body of local technical staff, as well as CDOT and RTD and, and some, uh, some other um, uh, representatives are on there. We have representatives from aviation and, and some other sources and, uh, and businesses and those types of things. So it's, it's a good sample. It is part of our metropolitan planning process. So any, anything that involves an MPO function must get uh, a recommendation from the TAC to go to RTC and the board. Um, so for example, like in, in Jefferson County, uh, Steve Durian on, on Jefferson County staff performs that role for for, uh, for, for Jefferson County right now. But we will, to, to Director Dale's point, we will reach out to local staff and make sure they are aware of this through our, our sub-regional forums. And, uh, but I also encourage the directors to, um, 
you know, to share board materials with, with their staff too, so that they can weigh in, um, you know, when you guys are coming to the meeting. So thank you all very much. And great, thank you. Director Brockett, did you uh, have something else here? Your hand is still up. It's an old hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just have one uh, question. When I, when I reviewed this uh, uh, pr before the meeting, uh, my natural inclination, if you go two slides ahead to the integration, uh, or, uh, yeah, right there. Um, my natural inclination was uh, to uh, option B, parallel, quickest overall schedule. But what I note here is that uh, the bullet points uh, that, that follow that are, are fairly negative. And I'm a little concerned that I don't see any cons on option A. And I'm wondering, uh, are you trying to lead us uh, to toward a sequential option uh, by uh, not telling us any of the negatives? Or is it truly that there are no negatives to the sequential approach? I think the best way to sum it up is neither of these are perfect options. And True. we realize that this tip process is going to be different than what we've done before. Um, I think I think the best thing to say about the sequential process is it really allows that RPD update, RTP update to really happen before we work through the process to select any potential capacity projects in the TIP. Um, because as an outcome of the greenhouse gas rulemaking, it is unsure exactly what is gonna be required of the RTP. Um, okay. When we look at the parallel process, we're it's sort of looking at where we're going to be potentially selecting those, uh, you know, roadway or any regionally significant projects at the same time that there is a potential update for the RTP, which may look at the opposite where we might need to potentially remove projects. Um, so I, I think that's where, in terms of staff, we certainly are leaning towards the sequential process. All right, that's fair. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions before we move on to the next item? I just want to, oh, uh, Director Dyack, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, from a process standpoint, if if we do go through this where we have monies, um, that will go through the 80-20 um, uh, tabulation. I just want to verify that. And then if if certain subregions or even the region doesn't have projects that qualify, um, would that money still reside with with those subregions and regions. I, I just wanna make sure I understand the process here. Yes, yeah, so any any funding that we have um, does automatically per tip policy get split 20% to the regional and 80% to the subregional. Um, the tip policy also stipulates that if we have any unallocated funds within the regional call, um, the unallocated funds will get transferred to the sub-regional sub -regional call and then, of course, split down uh, percentage-wise and targeted to the individual sub-regions. So, so if a, if a sub-region doesn't have any projects, say, that are on the wait list, um, the, the options would be not to do another call for, for additional wait list projects. It would be just to retain the money for the, for the next tip cycle. Is that correct? Unsure. I, I'd have to get back with you, honestly, on that, because we're looking at each one of these calls is going to contain different funding sources for different years. Um, so one potential solution might be to look to ways to redistribute that funding to other subregions who potentially could use it. Um, quite honestly, I, I don't know off just off the top of my head what other solutions that we could come across with. Yeah, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm sort of trying to maybe get a, uh, extend Director Teal's um, uh, earl, earlier thought is that, you know, obviously we, we have, we have projects and we're, we're late in the TIF cycle. Some, some of those waitlist projects may actually have been um, either funded by a, a set aside or uh, funded locally. Uh, so to, um, we, I'm sure there, there's certainly projects within the subregion that would that would qualify or that we would also like to have funded. But at at this late stage, if you only have two or three projects uh, and maybe uh, one or two or capacity, 
and then another couple are um, qualified but have been funded already, um, the next steps would be, and I think that's, that's where I, I don't have the answer as well. So looking forward to, to future clarity. Thank you. Certainly. Before I go to do, uh, Director Brockett again, uh, uh, Ron, do you have something to uh, add to this? Yeah, I, I think if I understand the question correctly, and, and Todd can correct me, but I, I, I believe that if there, there, if there aren't enough projects in a subregion to utilize the available money in the waitlist process, then that money stays with that subregion and gets rolled into the full call for projects in the, in the tip cycle. Hmm. Okay. I think that's the question that, that Director Dyack was asking. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, okay. Um, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair, but yeah, no, I, I just wanted to understand, um, you know, I think the flexibility is there if, if, if that's the way it is. Um, you know, I, I just don't know if we have enough projects on the wait list or projects that fit into <clears throat> in these buckets. But we certainly, uh, you know, from a sub-region perspective, have projects that would that would qualify. We just don't have them on the wait list because um, of of many various reasons. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Director Brockett, you're up again. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, are you looking for feedback from the directors tonight or, or is this just a question opportunity? I would give your feedback right now. Great, well, I'll, I'll just say it seems like option A seems like a good way to go just to get started on that earlier money as quickly as possible and then let the RTP update proceed and avoid staff overload and potential policy misalignment, which sounds troublesome. So mm -hmm. option A sounds pretty good. Thank you. Uh, Director Walton, you are up. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering kind of what the next step was or kind of that action steps. Um, if we were going to be asked to, you know, choose one of these options, I guess, at the next board meeting and wanted some, I, I joined a little late, so sorry if this was covered earlier in the presentation, um, wanted to get a sense of what would require more staff time between option A and B um, for the at the local level. Todd, do you want to take that? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, certainly on the local level, um, option A is certainly going to take additional staff time. Um, we're essentially conducting four calls for projects back to back versus parallel, it's just two. Um, in terms of action items, uh, we have had this conversation with TAC, we're having this conversation with you. Um, we are certainly going to take all feedback. We will incorporate the feedback we have into the TIP policy document. Um, we expect um, to update the board on the TIP policy coming up in December. Um, and then we'll be looking for, uh, at your January meeting, looking for a recommendation. So we will certainly, as we kind of continue along, incorporate this information um, into the TIP policy document and then continue to release information as we prepare for those calls. Um, one of the next steps that we will be taking uh, based on your feedback here um, is certainly developing an overall schedule that will assist the forums to sort of go through these steps at one, as we lead up to late January, but then certainly starting with that regional call in January to outline the steps that the forums need to take um, to go through these calls for projects. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Director Shaw, you are up. Thank you. I would just like to express a preference for option A, the sequential. Um, the ability to get money in the hands of jurisdictions even three months earlier may prove to be very useful um, when all of the processes are completed and uh, challenges that always are inherent with these projects or experience. So the extra time may be a real benefit. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Director Mulvey, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I'm also in favor of the first option, not just because of the timing issues that have been expressed, but also because I think it presents some flexibility to the municipalities. 
in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, uh, Director Brockett, your hand is still up. Are you? Do you want to come back in? Another old hand. Apologize. <laughs> okay, not a problem at all. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great discussion. Uh, let's move on to uh, item five, uh, discussion of greenhouse gas uh, planning rule revised proposal. I went through this and my head is swimming at uh, the comments that were accepted and denied and whatnot. So uh, 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 Ron Papsdorf is gonna walk us through this uh, presentation and uh, strap in folks, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Let's see if this is in presentation mode. All right, you should be seeing my there you greenhouse go. gas good. transportation planning rulemaking presentation. That's good. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Ron Papsdorf. I am the Transportation Planning and Operations Division Director at Dr. Cog. Uh, good to be, is it good? Good to be talking with you about the greenhouse gas rulemaking again. We thought we were done with this about four weeks ago. Um, we are not. Um, so just by just bringing you up to speed, um, back on October 6th at your special meeting, the board endorsed a set of comments that were submitted to CDOT as part of the rulemaking process uh, the next day. Um, and then um, uh, about 13 days later, almost two weeks, um, CDOT issued a revised proposed rule. Um, and as part of that re revised rule, extended the public comment period an additional month to November 18th. Um, so we have we've been spending some time reviewing that revised proposal. Um, I think the, the good news is um, that there were a number of comments that um, you all submitted, that you all um, agreed to and, and uh, pr provided to CDOT as part of the rulemaking that were incorporated into this revised proposal. Uh, there were several that were not, and then there are some new issues that are that are raised um, for us in the kind of our new issues raised in the in the proposed rule. So I kind of want to go through that a little bit this afternoon, and um, we'll we'll quickly review that the the revised proposal in the context of the comments that that were made and the response to those comments, as well as the the new issues um, that that uh, we've identified in in our review of the revised proposal. Then want to have some discussion with you and get some direction about sort of next steps. There is a uh, your next board uh, meeting on November 17th would offer an opportunity if the board uh, desires to adopt some new or additional or resub or resupport um, uh, previous comments to submit again uh, to the rulemaking uh, by that noon deadline on the 18th. So I've got the revised schedule in the in the packet for you uh, going back to July 15th when the commission authorized the rulemaking, the notice rulemaking um, in August, uh, that 60 day written comment period that ended in October. Um, the revised schedule now extends that to the 18th of November, as I mentioned, and now the commission um, uh, will consider adopting the proposed rule at their December 16th meeting uh, rather than their November meeting. And likewise, the effective date of the rule now extends out a month to the middle of February instead of the middle of January. So that's an update on the schedule. Just a quick reminder for um, those who haven't been paying attention closely over the last, I don't know, six plus hours, we've all talked about the, the greenhouse gas rule. Uh, this rule does amend it. The, the greenhouse gas transportation rule amends an existing uh, state rule uh, related to transportation planning process. Uh, the rule components include a preamble, there's some revised definitions, uh, there's some revisions to the statewide transportation uh, plan piece of the existing rule, and then uh, amendments to the regional and statewide transportation plan process. And then the meat of the greenhouse gas rule is in this new section eight. We've talked about those before, about the planning reduction, the greenhouse gas reduction levels, determining compliance, mitigation measures, uh, uh, confirmation verification by the Air Pollution Control Division of the state, um, and then uh, enforcement, which the revised proposal now calls uh, compliance, and then uh, the reporting component. Mr. Chair, I do see uh, Director Moby's hand is up, and I didn't know if she had a question now or she wanted to wait until the end of the presentation. Uh, oh, that was a mistake. I apologize, and thank you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna get a little bit um, into um, kind of the the comments. Um, there were a couple of attachments included in the packet for you. So the the, the final letter that was submitted with with uh, Dr. Cock comments, and then the attachment three to the packet was sort of a matrix of a little bit more detail on the comments that were submitted and um, some a little bit more detail on how the revised proposal responded or didn't to those comments. I'll go through that in summary real quick. Um, so the first comment was removing the baseline projections from table one of the rule. Um, so the revised proposal does that. It, it removes those the baselines from table one. It revises the definition of the baseline to refer to uh, the emissions that are produced by sort of our most recently adopted model resulting from our from the most recent RTP. So um, as of the effective date of the rule. So it sort of clarifies the definition of what is the baseline and sort of takes that out of the rule. We think that that that's a good response to our comment about allowing flexibility for the um, kind of adaptation over time as circumstances change. Population employment forecast might change pretty significantly from what we what we know now. Um, we the board had um, requested that the 2025 reduction levels in Table One uh, apply to uh, the Pikes Peak area, the Grand Valley MPO area, and the Pueblo area uh, MPO area, um, and that was not included in the rise proposal. Um, there was a uh, comment to allow analysis of non-regionally significant projects when we're doing our compliance determination so that we can evaluate the full scope of um, our, the plan in question. And so there was language added in that section uh, to, to allow that um, and that sort of the regionally significant projects at a minimum allow us to sort of look at the other, other important components of the plan when we're doing the analysis. Uh, there was a comment to revise a section to clarify that the analysis compares sort of the estimated emissions uh, from the plan to the to the value of subtracting the base the reduction levels from the baseline that was that was not included. So um, CDOT has prepared a little bit of a starting point of a technical um, work. We will continue to have to work with them uh, without a change like this on sort of how to do the modeling, how to do the assessment and the, and the compliance. Um, the, the next comment was to clarify that the analysis of TIPS applies to the last year of the TIP. So remember, if we, we adopt a near-term four-year transportation improvement program, pretty tough to do a compliance assessment for the year 2050 horizon year, which is, you know, would be 25 years in the future, um, kind of a, a doesn't add value because uh, TIPS have to be compliant, have to be consistent with your regional transportation plan that goes through that that longer term compliance, that change was reflected in the revised proposal. Uh, there was a, a comment to uh, require MPOs and CDOT to prepare and publish a calibration and validation report that also was not addressed in the, in the revised proposal. There was a comment to require consultation with MPOs when developing the mitigation measures process and guidelines that was incorporated into the revised proposal. There was a comment to, uh, to clarify how the restrictions on congestion mitigation air quality funds and the surface transportation block grant funds, CMAC and SDBG funds during the compliance determination is only necessary to the extent that to the achieve the greenhouse gas reduction level. So there was some language added to clarify that the restriction is as necessary to achieve the reduction levels. Uh, so that's a, a, a positive response to a comment from Dr. Cog. Okay, I think I, there we go, thank you. Okay, um, the next comment was to um, add a provision to require sponsors of regionally significant roadway capacity projects to identify and include mitigation measures when those projects are um, included in a TIP or the STIP. Um, and so kind of when actual funding is allocated to those projects uh, to, to start the implementation phases of those projects. Um, the, the revised proposal adds some, some language in the preamble of the rule, um, which by reminder, the preamble is good constant context information, but does not have any force or effect. It's not, it's not enforceable. It's not binding. Um, so it adds some context 
about um, CDOT and MPOs and others considering mitigations at the time a project is developed and submitted into a transportation plan. So transportation plan is a broader term than, than the TIP or the STIP when we're actually allocating funding. So didn't quite hit the mark on that one in, in terms of including it in the rule and sort of addressing the, the, the funding tie to the TIP and the STIP. Uh, the next comment was uh, clarifying that um, all CMAC, SDB, and 10-year plan funds are restricted if the compliance isn't achieved and remove that link. It's sort of related to a previous comment, but it was, was not addressed in the, in the revised proposal. Um, the next comment was to clarify that only MPOs um, can seek a waiver or a reconsideration and allow 60 days for that action. Uh, that request to happen um, after, after the Transportation Commission action on the compliance report rather than 30 days. So that was included into the revised proposal. Um, and then uh, the next comment was to only require a waiver request for reasonably significant projects. So uh, by reminder, there's a lot of projects that are included in a TIP or an RTP that are safety projects or operational projects that, that really don't affect um, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, but can, can help us address really significant priority um, issues in the region and the transportation system. And if we're not meeting the reduction standards, then our STBG and CMAC funding would be restricted. We would not be allowed uh, to use the, that money on those types of projects unless we got a specific waiver. And again, our comment was, we shouldn't have to get a waiver from the Transportation Commission to use those funds on otherwise eligible projects that aren't reasonably significant and therefore aren't going to have that kind of impact on, on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then uh, the last two comments here, uh, the rule should clarify the meaning of a substantial increase. Um, and this is in sort of that uh, uh, evaluating a waiver uh, request. Um, and that was, that was not included in the um, in the revised proposal. And then finally, uh, this was a comment to sort of get away, get um, uh, remove the sort of pocket veto language in the in the rule that said that, you know, if if the commission doesn't take any action, then um, the request for a waiver or reconsideration is deemed to be denied. So that was deleted from, from the rule in the revised proposal. So that, sorry, I, I went through that fairly quickly, but we've, we've talked about that a lot, but I wanted to get through that list. And before I move into a couple of new items that are raised in the revised proposal, and then we can go back and go back and revisit um, anything else, anything that the board wants to. So a couple of other changes in the preamble. Uh, there is a, a pretty new, big new section added in the preamble that identifies core principles to guide the selection and delivery of mitigation measures. Um, uh, gives gives some context for sort of intent on that process, but again has has no rule has no real rule effect. It's not binding. It's not enforceable, but it does give a good indication of sort of the direction that CDOT intends to take. Um, so considering benefits to disproportionately impacted communities, having a geographic nexus between the mitigation measures and the impacts um, uh, of of the pro of the particular project. Um, Holistic air quality planning, um, which which really raises does raise an issue that we've been thinking about a lot about um, kind of would not um, allow um, kind of operational improvements that improve traffic flow. So we do we do we do intersection operational improvements that sort of address a hot spot at an intersection and can significantly reduce. Um, delay and reduce fuel consumption and therefore reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But under this guiding principle, those things uh, would not be um, would not be considered would not be allowed to be considered mitigation measures. Um, then there's a ver there's a verification core principle and sort of uh, a kind of having having the mitigation measures be at a reasonable scale to the impact of the, of, the, of the project. So that's one issue in the preamble. Um, in section 8.02 for determining compliance, um, it, it does add some, some uh, a new section that res the restrictions on CMAC, SDBG funds, and the 10-year plan funds don't apply to projects that have been advertised for construction with funding identified prior to the adoption of the planning documents. So remember, the applicable planning documents are the TIPS and the Regional Transportation Plan. 
as well as the 10 year plan uh, for CDOT. Um, so basically, if we don't meet compliance, there are some sort of projects that are already well underway that have already been advertised for construction. And this language would say um, the rule is not going to stop those from from proceeding because they're they're just too far down the path um, uh, towards implementation. Um, and then there's um, some additional illustrative examples of mitigation measures added to that section, particularly focused on kind of rural area sort of examples of what, mit what mitigation measures um, would be appropriate or could be appropriate. Um, in section 8.05, this is now the compliance section. This was the enforcement section. Um, it does add uh, a 30 day or an next regularly scheduled meeting, a timeline for the commission to make a determination, which is, a, a, we think, a pretty good addition. There actually was not, had not been a time frame, time frame identified in the rule uh, for that. Um, waivers can be requested at any time, including concurrently with the submission of a greenhouse gas transportation report. So I think the intent of this new language was to, if, if, you're, if you're submitting your compliance report, you're not, and, and you know you want to request a waiver for some set of projects, you can submit that with your greenhouse gas transportation report um, instead of waiting or doing it with it, waiting until after the commission actually kind of makes their determination. Um, it also um, adds um, a, a requirement that um, a request for reconsideration has to be submitted within 30 days. So this now conflicts with section 8.05.2, which was changed um, and uh, was, was changed in a way that was consistent with one of our comments to request that that, that time frame be extended from 30 days to 60 days to give us time to work with the board to decide if we wanted to submit a waiver or, or a reconsideration request in this case. Um, and that change was made in the previous section, but then this new language was added that the reconsideration request had to be made in 30 days, within 30 days. So there's a, a new conflict that was created with uh, that new addition. Um, and then the last, the last, um, the last one is um, in the reporting section. This the 8.06 reporting existed in the in the in the previous uh, rule. Um, and it really kind of set a requirement for CDOT to report to the commission periodically. I think it was every five years. Now it's every three, three years about sort of status. Um, but it adds this new requirement that beginning September 1st of next year and every year after that, um, CDOT has to provide a report to the commission documenting vehicle miles traveled per capita for MPO areas and statewide for the previous year. And it's the previous calendar year. So the, the report on September 1st of 2022 would report on the year from January of 21 through December of 21. And then each year, then the next year would be for 22 and so forth and so on. Um, if the vehicle miles traveled per capita does not decrease for three consecutive years in any one area, so any of the five MPOs or on a statewide level, um, so even if all the MPOs, the BMP per capita was trending down or not increasing, but, uh, but the non-MPO part of the state, it was going up, then the commission would consider revisions to the rules to achieve reductions in vehicle miles traveled uh, consistent with the intent of the rule. So I want to talk about this one a little bit because this is a pretty significant new addition uh, to the rule. Um, so one, Vehicle miles traveled is not something you measure, you estimate it. Um, you, we, we can't go out and count every trip that occurs on the transportation system um, every year. Um, so that creates some, some challenges. You might also know that you know, for 2021 and 2020 before this, um, you know, we're, we're at a stage primarily because of a, a global pandemic and reduced economic activity and uh, reduced employment levels that that VMT is down. Uh, we're starting it so right. so the the starting point for this analysis would be a, a down year, uh, an unusually down year, and then um, you know you you couldn't and you'd have to see a decrease um, from that for, for over three years. That that seems a little problematic uh, given that we we think that this is while it's been a good outcome, a positive outcome of the pandemic. There's a lot of bad reasons uh, why we've had that out outcome um, related to the pandemic. So that's a, that's a little challenging. The other challenging part of this is the fact that, you know, even if we're doing really well and we're achieving BMT per capita reductions in our region, if another MPO isn't, 
or if at, a, at the non-MPO part of the state or statewide isn't, then you know, potentially there's, there's new rulemaking that gets triggered um, that, that to, to, to actually um, achieve reductions in, in VMT. And, and my last comment on this is that while there is, is some correlation between vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions, it's, it's, not, a it's not a straight causation. Um, there are a lot, of, lot of, um, a lot of impacts on greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. It's primarily related to fuel consumption. And um, you might have the same level of vehicle miles traveled, but operating better and less congestion and burning less fuel for that same VMT level um, and, and therefore emitting less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and, and the state law, Senate Bill 260, that sort of led to this rulemaking doesn't speak to a VMT rule, it speaks to a greenhouse gas rule. And I think that at least we feel as staff that bringing in vehicle miles traveled into this rule and trying to intermingle um, VMT and greenhouse gas emissions sort of isn't quite consistent with, with the law. So a um, lot, of, lot of issues with this one. It's a, it's a pretty tough one. Um, understand sort of the desire here, but I think there's a lot of reasons why we think it's it's not a great idea. Sounds like a ratchet effect, doesn't it? A little bit. Um, so um, just kind of kind of discussion again. So I, just to get you started, some of the questions that we have, you know, are there are there comments that weren't addressed from Dr. Cog that you want to consider sort of resubmitting, um, and then kind of get your reaction and discussion about sort of that operational improvements as mitigation measures issue, uh, the, that, that reconsideration timing conflict and the BMT provision. With that, I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any directors have questions um, just to get it started? Okay, uh, uh, Director Odoricio, go ahead. Hey team, um, I'm looking at this and uh, can, can you clarify the uh, issue of, of the modeling again, uh, the EPA versus the Dr. Cog model? Um, that's one question. I just want to make sure we're, at least our team is all on the same page on this. And then um, and then I have a couple others, but I, we, I wanted to start with that just to make sure that we're, you know, being able to address some of our, our issues about making sure that we model this correctly so we can understand uh, how it has impacted, especially so we're not using two different methodologies. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Director Odoricio. Um, yeah, the, you know, the rule does have some good language about the collaboration, the cooperation around setting, um, consistency around the modeling process. We think that's all good. We look forward to participating in that work. Um, as we've talked to the board about before, there, there are a series of models here, right? And so there's our travel demand model that is sort of the, the Dr. Cog travel model. That's, what, that's how we estimate travel patterns, travel demand. Uh, it's all based on population and employment impacts and information about the transportation system and, and travel behavior. Output, certain outputs from that model then are input into the MOVES model. That's the EPA model that estimates actual air pollution emissions including greenhouse gas emissions. So the two models work together. Our, the Dr. Cog travel model does not, does not estimate pollution emissions. It doesn't, it doesn't estimate volatile organic compound emissions or greenhouse gas um, emissions. It estimates travel patterns. We take those travel patterns and information about the transportation system and put that in, and that goes into the MOVES model, which actually estimates the air quality uh, the, the air pollution emissions. So they do work together. There's a component in the rule that talks about collaborating, cooperating, making sure that we have consistent processes. We think that's largely been addressed in the rule. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'll, I'll follow up with other questions after we go around. I don't want to take up all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks, Ron, for all your work on this. And uh, uh, let me just lower my hand here so I don't end up being one of those old hands. Um, <laughs> I think so. Uh, there's several of our comments that I think are worth resubmitting. But for now, I think what I want to focus on is, is the, what they put in the preamble 
um, and, and whether that should be in the regulation instead. And if, if the Transportation Commission says that the preamble actually will have some teeth in some way in, in this document, maybe I wouldn't be concerned about it, but um, I think that there are a couple of things that really need to be in the role. Um, there's the, let me find it. Um, oh, the provision that adds language to the preamble that um, CDOT and the MPOs shall consider mitigations at the time a project is developed and submit submitted. That's really important. <laughs> um, that's directive language that um, I think, um, you know, the preamble probably isn't strong enough for that. Uh, the new language um, around um, the purpose of the mitigation measures it, 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 there as well. Um, I, I think in order to actually be effective, I'd like us to suggest that those actually be reworked into policy so that they're effective. Um, and then, you know, that we have some other comments as well, but I, I think I do just want to speak to that very last point about the VMT reductions. And while I was one who testified at the Transportation Commission that I think we need to have a VMT reduction uh, target in here because so much about modeling is, is gonna be pretty loose and unknown and VMT is a, is a, you know, there's a closer correlation and I understand your comments, Ron, on that. Um, I, I, it, I'm a little, puzzled if there isn't a regulation or a, a, a provision in the rule rather that requires a VMT reduction or sets a target. Um, it, it's puzzling to me how you would um, ascertain that we need to revise the rule because we're not meeting standards or targets that aren't in the rule. So uh, I think I, I would rather see them actually put some thresholds for reductions in the rule um, and then have this approach of um, having a three year period to look for reductions and, and then revise the rule to achieve those if it's not happening and recognizing you know, the issues that you've identified around, well, what happens if one region is and another region isn't, you don't wanna, you don't wanna have those revisions apply all across the state, I, you know, I think that's a challenge, but I think that's something that can be drafted around and, and also recognizing that we might be in a lull. But I guess I would just say, I think it's a good idea to have some those VMT reduction targets. Um, and if they don't adopt them, then I agree that it's, it's um, not, you know, just saying we're gonna revise the rule for not meeting a target that doesn't exist wouldn't be a good approach. Thank you. Certainly, Ron, do you have a comment on that? I, 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 I think staff has a slightly different perspective than Director Levy, and I think that's fine. Um, we, we, I think from a staff perspective, we don't think this rule is the place for a BMT reduction target. It should, we should be focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that that's kind of the staff perspective. And kind of tying in BMT reduction <laughs> is sort of a a little bit of a um, kind of a different thing, and we we don't we don't believe that it's a, a straight up causation between sort of alignment between BMT and um, and greenhouse gas emissions. And and let me say for the record, like Dr. Cog and we we believe and we we have targets to reduce BMT per capita. We do um, for a lot of good reasons, um, and, and air quality is one of them. Um, but for for the reasons that I articulated as a staff level, we just don't think it's appropriate to. To tie in PMT reductions into into the greenhouse gas rule, um, the way the rule has. Thank you, uh, Director Mulvey. Go ahead, <laughs> or Director Levy. Did you want to retort? <laughs> well, no, I don't want to retort. <laughs> um, uh, um, I'm not feeling retortful. But um, <laughs> no, if you just, what do you think of the idea, though, of uh, on what's in the preamble and whether that. Um, 
really belongs in the rule, it does it have any effect being in the preamble? Yeah, Director Levy, I, I, look, I, I, we staff staff was supportive, and and we appreciated the board agreeing with sort of the comment to to tie mitigation measures to regionally significant roadway projects when they're being added to the tip and the stip. We think that's that's a that's really appropriate. We think that's really helpful and will help us over time achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions. It ties specific mitigation measures to specific projects that might have an, a, a negative impact. Um, and so, you know, I think from a staff perspective, we would support sort of resubmitting that comment again. And, you know, I think CDOT did a, CDOT was trying to accommodate that by putting in the preamble. I, again, I think our, our perspective is, was just a little bit off the mark from what our comment was. And, you know, we think that that would be a valuable addition to the rule. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Mulvey, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I wasn't planning on getting into that that subject, but as the conversation occurred, um, I do want to add something to it that may not have been thought about. I perhaps somebody hasn't spoken on it yet. Has is thinking about it, but the mandate of the two laws that this emanated from was greenhouse gases, not vehicle miles traveled. So I think if we propose or somebody else proposes a different metric or to propose a different standard, you're exceeding the mandate of the legislation. That concerns me. Um, and maybe that's just, you know, that brain I have that looks at that kind of stuff. The other concern I would have is if if we put a false target in there, why would we put a target we know is defective? So if we're going to comment on this, if there's a consensus to comment on it, just as with the substantial language that we discussed last time, perhaps we can craft some language that asks for the target to reflect the concerns that have been articulated that address that it's not going to apply or that it would have inequitable results. So for example, all of those communities that have successfully implemented means by which to um, reduce the impact of the miles that are traveled by putting in or incentivizing EVs or putting in charging stations, well, then they're, that's going to short shrift the entire region. Um, it's going to render absolutely meaningless all of that effort because those miles are still being traveled. So I, I, we really should think carefully about that metric if we're going to use it. So my go, going to my question, um, I'm in section eight and I have two questions. On section 8.02.6.1.3, I didn't name it that. Um, the restrictions don't apply to projects, you've mentioned this, that have been advertised for construction and funding identified prior to the adoption of the, the rules. Is, does that mean if you've, like where in the process is your approval that you get grandfathered in and don't have to go through all of this? That's my first question. Um, Mr. Chair, Director Mulvey, so on the on that section you referenced about sort of um, a, a safe harbor, I guess, provision for current for current projects for projects that have advertised for construction. So the the applicable planning documents are the transportation improvement plan adoption and uh, regional transportation plan adoptions and amendments. So um, if so our first planned trigger for the rule will be our update to our current 2050 RTP, which uh, we're targeting to have completed by the October 1 deadline of next year. Um, so that would trigger compliance assessment. Um, if there's a project included in the plan that already has been advertised for construction by that point, then there and using SDBG funds through Dr. Cog, um, it would it would not be 
uh, it, th those funds for that project would not be restricted. Um, does... I think I got it, but I might have a follow-up after I think about it more. Um, just that learning curve. My next question is a couple paragraphs down, 8.02.6, now 0 0.3. Um, this says mitigation measures are needed to count towards reduction levels, blah, blah, blah. It basically, like, my question on this paragraph is, is this new language, is that changing things substantively? And if so, what is it? Because I'm not getting it. It looks bad. But it might not be. Uh, I think our, our our assessment of that is it's a it's a it's a clarification of the intent of that section of the rule and and consistent with the language we had already reviewed, um, and um, just just clarifies sort of when which mitigation measures you have to actually would be subject to that um, that um, action that mitigation action plan and, and reporting. So we think that's we think that's clear, primary clarifying language. Thank you. My third question involves a few provisions, and I did bring it up earlier today. Um, there seems to be a new definition for greenhouse gases. Um, that's one item in 1.17. And so these are definitional questions in the definitional section. So the first question in that section was, how did we get the definition for greenhouse gases? I'm just curious about the source, um, not critical, just curious. Um, I, I, I don't know about the source and um, I, I might um, at the chair's discretion, if, um, if Director White is, is on the call, she may be able to address that specifically. My understanding is that this is a pretty, pretty standard accepted definition of greenhouse gas pollutants. Um, and the, the revision here was just to try to reflect that rather than sort of a little bit more of a shorthand definition that was in the original rule. Gotcha, yeah, it does look meatier. Okay, then my second one is the one that addresses a couple other things. There seems to be a change in the definition for how regionally significant projects can change. So in section 1.42, it looks as though, um, oh, now I can't find it. Um, it looks as though you can change how something is considered or defined to be regionally significant. And then that ends up affecting 8.02.3 when you look at a regionally significant project under the mitigation plan. I was wondering how that came about. So, um, uh, Director Mulvey, this is the, that additional language that's highlighted there in the revised rule was um, to address some some issues that had been raised by rural areas of the state. Where, so remember, MPOs like Dr. Cog have to adopt a definition of regionally significant project. We we have that as part of our federal planning process. That's approved by our federal partners uh, as part of our 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 planning process and the definition of regionally significant projects accounts for that. Our approved definition of regionally significant projects is what applies in our MPO area. We're good with that language. This change is saying that for those rural areas where they don't have federal transportation planning responsibility, um, they wanted a process where they could, they could work with the state interagency consultation team to develop a definition that would apply to their area, uh, you know, can, can, in consultation with CDOT and, and the other partners involved in that process. So this change does not affect Dr. Cott. Okay. So it's a may, not a must, and it's not, okay. Kind of looks like somebody could step in and change it on us. No, they, they, they may not. Okay. Thank you for those clarifications. Thank you. Uh, Director Shaw, you're up. Thank you. Uh, I, I had a thought on the VMT question. Um, it does seem like it's overreaching as staff believes um, for addressing greenhouse gas legislation as this rule is meant to do. But uh, I could certainly see that a jurisdiction in presenting a project 
might use VMT as some of the rationale to support um, the, the, what this project that jurisdiction is putting forth um, is doing and what they hope to accomplish. So it is a, a, I think Ron, you said this as well, that it is important that we, we work to reduce VMT, but um, it is not always correlative to, um, you know, reducing greenhouse gases. Um, so just a thought there, I, I, I see Director Levy's point on um, incorporating this in some way, and it might be up to that, the jurisdiction. I also had a comment about, um, this came up uh, in our Douglas County sub-regional um, tip group today, that um, this rule doesn't make allowances or consideration of existing transportation uh, infrastructure investments. And because it doesn't take those into account, um, it's almost like a penalty for a region who has pre-planned uh, when in reality, those regions pre-planning perhaps should be rewarded because the, the bigger um, picture um, is there to support uh, their, their current project, but it was an, an expenditure that was made quite some time ago. Um, I, I know that we as Douglas County are going to incorporate that in the letter that we send, um, but I, I, I would love for us to find a way to incorporate that into our ask for an addition in the rules. Um, or perhaps an addition in the scoring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Odoricio. I, I think um, Director Shaw really hit the nail on the head that VMT is a valid and could can be an important means to an end. I put that in the chat, so sorry if it's a little redundant, but it's a means to an end. And, and, and should not be considered an end, but it could be a very valuable means. And so if it helps achieve the greenhouse gas reductions, then that's a great, um, a great mitigation measure. I just wanna make sure that we're also including some of the others uh, that are important to help us achieve those greenhouse gas uh, reductions, which include operational mitigation measures. Um, and then also the ability to bundle, which allows us to kind of take a few of them and, and not have just one means to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're, we're trying to achieve a, a goal here. And I think the more we can make the goal achievable by many different folks in many different jurisdictions, uh, then we are achieving our ultimate objective and our goal. Uh, and I don't want us to, 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 to narrow it down just to only a few things. I think the more we can make this inclusive, we can all on this call participate and we can all uh, have a part in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Director Brockett, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for that, Director Rodriguez. I think that was very well put. Um, so, I, and staff, I, I definitely hear your concerns about the VMT provision as written, and you know, Director Levy pointed that out as well. And just my my comment would be, um, hopefully, we can send a comment that doesn't say ignore VMT, but that points out the specific issues with the way it's being proposed, while potentially looking for a way to examine VMT and, um, and decreases or increases in their direct effect on greenhouse gas emissions. So that you, um, you're, to your point, Ron, about how their different kinds of VMT have different benefits or, or, or problems, you know, that it, that it takes that into account. That's, that's my comment on that. And then just in terms of resubmitting previous comments, um, I, I thought, um, the point about um, resubmitting the one of them that says take it out of the preamble and put it into actionable language made sense. Staff, are there others that you would advocate for us resubmitting that you think are particularly important? Ron, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Brockett, I, I think um, yes, we we 
remain, um, I think we remain committed to the notion that sort of waiver requests for all projects seems like a, a, an unnecessary step. Um, that sort of uh, kind of tying waiver requests to specific reasonably significant projects makes sense in the context of the rule. But as we've stated before and discussed before, there are there are a lot of investments in a in a plan or a tip that are not reasonably significant, but are really important. Uh, not reasonably significant as defined under the rule, right? Not those big capacity projects, um, but are really important to the region achieving um, other important transportation priorities uh, like like safety. Um, and and to have to to have to have to submit a waiver request it, in in the case where we aren't meeting the reduction levels um, and to have to ask the commission for a, a waiver to use funds that are suballocated to us by the federal government to use on projects that are eligible for those funds that won't have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions um, it seems inappropriate and I, I think that's staff's that remains staff's feeling so I think that's probably one where we would we would suggest that that be that be reiterated back to to see that as as um, part of this. Okay, great. That makes sense. And I guess the, the one other one I would uh, I would call out would be um, appreciate that that they said that there there would be uh, collaboration with the MPOs on the modeling and the validation report. I continue to feel like having the parameters be public uh, would be very beneficial. So that that would be one that I would advocate for the uh, going back about that public aspect of it. That's Thank all you. Thank you. Excellent discussion. I really appreciate it. Uh, I don't have any other directors in the queue, and that's good because we have a very important P&E uh, meeting coming up right after this in about three minutes. So, uh, uh, Steve, I don't know if you're going to go over and start that meeting now, but uh, I just uh, want to let you all know I appreciate the discussion. It was very good. And uh, seeing no other business, I will uh, declare the meeting to be adjourned. We'll see the P&E members over at uh, over at the next meeting. Thank you all. See you in two weeks. Thanks, Bye. Kevin. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night.